Recently, I custom fabricated an out-of-production rubber fuel tank mount for the GPZ-1000 motorcycle I'm restoring. I covered that process in episode 7 of the project series where I talked a lot about the 3D printing and the urethane casting that went into it, but didn't really get too into the nitty gritty of how I derived the initial 3D model from a single picture using software mint for visual effects. I got a lot of comments asking for a separate video going into more detail on that, so hey, welcome to that video. Now the easiest approach to model a part like this would of course be to take a set of calipers and measure it and draw it out in CAD software, but the whole reason that I'm modeling it in the first place is because I don't have it. However, there's a really common process for 3D modeling something you don't have, and that's to use pictures as background images for you to essentially just trace. Look up any car modeling video and that's what you're gonna find. It's a rock solid approach to modeling, but it's only possible if the pictures you have are orthographic, meaning they're from exactly the side and there's no perspective warping. So because the only photos I have of the part are from a listing online, that exact method isn't possible here, but because the part is rectangular in shape, and I should stress only because it's rectangular in shape, the same concept can still be applied with the help of a program called FSpy. Now FSpy is mainly used in the visual effects world as a tool to help digitally recreate interior spaces. In here, you're able to load up a picture, and after lining up these segments to find the vanishing points of each axis, you're not only given the focal length of the camera used to take the photo, but also its position and orientation in 3D space. Similar to how three points define a plane, three vanishing points define a camera. Is that right? Huh. So I just need to do the same thing for this. The software is usually pretty good about assuming where the third vanishing point is, but you can add it manually, and doing so usually only makes it more accurate. And the last thing to do here is to set the origin. Now I would love to put it right in the middle of the part, but there isn't really a defining feature that dictates where the center line is, not like a sharp edge in the middle or anything, so I'm just gonna put it on the corner here. That's gonna be a little bit of an inconvenience, but nothing that can't be sorted out. Now this software is just for the camera information, so to actually do some modeling, we gotta bring it over to Blender. Importing the file automatically creates the virtual camera and automatically sets the original image as the background here too. And we can see the coordinate grid is perfectly oriented to match the part. And to verify that, we can add in a new cube, align its corner with the origin, and start pulling in the side so they match up with the edges, and push the last one out so it's on the other corner too. And yeah, everything is lining up exactly as it should. This looks good. All right, now to actually start the modeling process. Now, because the part is symmetrical, I only actually have to model one half of it and then just mirror it over to the other side. Now that mirroring takes place around this orange dot, which is the object's origin point. That point can be anywhere you set it to, not necessarily the center of the object. So to make sure it's centered, we can go into object, set origin, and origin to geometry. And now the little dot is right where it's supposed to be. So, back in edit mode, I can add in a loop cut right in the middle, delete the other half, and add on that mirror modifier. And now everything I do to one side is happening on the other side too. Now modeling the outer part is the easy bit, since this is all really blocky. I just have to extrude this, add a loop cut, extrude, adjust an edge, adjust another edge, and extrude that part too. And that's not looking too bad, it kind of looks like the actual thing now. Though the middle bit is a little more complex. To start, I'm gonna add in some edge loops that intersect right at the corners of the little side triangle piece. Then delete those faces and bridge the side, then the main face. And that looks good already. Now the top part can be extruded up, and then the edges can be adjusted to get everything in line. You might think that the cylinders were the trickiest part to do, but it was actually probably the easiest. I just added loop cuts on four sides and made sure to make them tangent to the circle. And theoretically, it should make a perfect square, and that looks like one to me. So then I subdivided that into a bunch of little squares and then dissolved them all into one. But what that did was make a bunch of tiny segments around the perimeter, meaning I can do the spherize command to turn these into a perfect circle. And now I can just scale, extrude, extrude and scale, extrude, Extrude and scale, 
and extrude to model this up. Easy. Now the top part can also be adjusted now to get the arc looking more correct. But yeah, that's it. That's all it took. This is a damn near perfectly proportioned replica of the actual part. Now you might say, Ronnie, your topology is absolute dog shit. And I might say, woohoo, I didn't know Captain Obvious watched me. As I explained in part 7 of the series, this model right here in Blender is only a starting point. You can absolutely design stuff in mesh modeling programs like Blender and have the files be ready to 3D print, but that's typically more for artistic oriented things like a sculpture or maybe something for cosplay like an Iron Man helmet. There might even be a series on that, I don't know. But for designing for manufacturing, CAD software is usually the way to go. Mainly because it's parametric, has the timeline editability, and the UI and toolset specifically with manufacturing in mind. So that's why I want to do it in there. And just like I traced the image in Blender, I'm going to trace the mesh model in Fusion 360. But first I gotta make sure the model is the right scale. I know that the cylindrical features on the part correspond to these holes in the tank, and that the center to center distance is exactly 4 centimeters. So what I can do is snap the object to the origin, make a cube and make it 4 units wide, and scale the model up until everything matches. And setting the shade view to flat makes it really easy to see where the center should be. But that should be the right scale now. So I can go to Fusion 360 and import that mesh file, making sure to choose centimeters as the units of the original file. And yep, 40 millimeters, that matches up. So to model this here in CAD, I'm just going to create a new component and just start tracing the old one. I'm going to assume that the Blender 3D model isn't 100% accurate, and also that the engineers at Kawasaki didn't make this part with any weird decimated values, because it's really just like a box. So I'm going to go back and dimension all of the lines and just round them to the nearest tenths place. Then I can just mark out the slant section, cut that away, mark out the cylinders, also dimensioning them, pull them out, and lastly cut away the center hole. And if we mirror this over, this looks pretty dang good. It looks very clean. But if we look at the other picture online of the factory part, you can see that I did miss the cutout on the back, as well as the little holes on either side. Like I said in part 7, I'm honestly pretty sure that those holes were just there for material and weight savings, so for what I'm doing, I'm not even going to bother with them. But I will go ahead and eyeball the back cutout for now. But of course it's not going to be 100% perfect as it is now. And that right there is the bulk of the tough work done. Now at this point, when I originally made this, I reached out to a guy named Joe on one of the Facebook groups for this bike, and he gave me the measurements for the exact dimensions of the cylindrical features, just because I didn't want to deal with the trial and error process of fine-tuning those because they interact with so many parts. And once that was done, I went ahead and 3D printed the first prototype. And as you may remember, I came across some issues with it, where it didn't want to sit properly on the bracket. But had I just looked at the part and thought about how it interacts with what is going on, I could have avoided these issues altogether. These little feet on the end? Well, they straddle this piece of sheet metal, so I just need to measure that width and apply it to the model. The angle of this slant here? Exactly 125 degrees, so I just need to apply that to the model. And so on, repeat that for everything. Yeah, so guess and check works, but if you think a little bit, you won't have to guess at all. Now as you know, I didn't 3D print the final part. I cast that in urethane. I could have 3D printed it in a flexible material, but I thought making a mold would be fun, so I wanted to try that out. And of course that mold was also 3D printed. The mold took some time to design, but the bulk of the work was done by taking the final model of the part and subtracting that shape from a rectangular prism. Then it was just a matter of getting rid of some overhangs that would have created a negative draft angle, and repeating that process for the other side too. There were a few other things done to make sure they slot together nicely, but that's the bulk of it. The very last things I did were make little features like breather holes for casting the urethane, and protrusions to help grab onto when going to separate the mold halves. But yeah, that was pretty much the whole process from getting to an image to a final mold for production. Hopefully this 10 minute and 15 second long video provided a bit more detail than the, the two minute segment did in part seven. And if you haven't seen that video or any of the other videos in this series, go check that out. 
as of recording this right now, I just released part eight two weeks ago. And as for part nine, let's just say that that project is already out of the barn and another one is in its place. All right, see you guys later.